this is yeah this is rare to see two distribution inference works in the same conference title alone back to back and thanks valentine for the great introduction on the topic um so this is work that i did with uh dave of course and then these undergrads yifu and yanjin and uh let's just dive right into it so this distribution inference uh if you try to formalize it it's the formalization is inspired a lot by yom et al's game for membership inference and what you do is you start with some natural distribution that's supposed to be public and you have these two possible scenarios which you can use to transform the distribution in some sense so like valentine said you could have let's say one distribution that's completely unbiased and then the other one is biased in um, some particular attribute or property as a concrete example maybe the first one produces a distribution where there's an equal likelihood of sampling males or females and the second one is biased by some ratio alpha in the sense that an alpha zero would mean no females, alpha one would mean all females, and you can vary this value. And then the game is set up in a way where the victim will randomly sample one of these distributions. And based on a data set coming from that training distribution, train a model M on it. And then the adversary's goal is to look at this model and public information in the game and info which of the two training distributions the data set actually came from. And in this work, we try to look at different aspects of this whole game and see if we can make contributions to it. So first off, we propose a new black box attack, which is the KL divergence attack. We then look at the different assumptions that we implicitly end up making in the black box setup and how they impact inference risk. We also try looking at uh, noise-based defenses that usually end up working really well for security and privacy and machine learning. And finally, we see what ends up happening if you try the trivial defense of resampling your actual data set itself. So uh, if you look at works in distribution inference, which is often also known as property inference in the field, you have this generic setup of these two distributions. And the way it works is that the adversary will train some n shadow models on both of these distributions. And based on some feature extraction method and labels assigned as zero and one, depending on which distribution it's coming from, train some sort of a meta classifier on it. And then at test time, by looking at some model M, the adversary can, with high confidence, infer which of the two training distributions this model M came from. And there's many ways you can extract these features from these models. You can look at the direct weights, uh, which is what was first done in the permutation invariant network architecture. It's also been extended to CNN models. And recently, it's also been extended, extended to the black box scenario, where you use model predictions on a specific set of query points, and you start as a feature vector. And what we want to do in this work is focus on the black box scenario. And we looked at a new kind of an attack that still requires shadow models, but doesn't really need a meta classifier approach. And the idea behind it is really simple, is that you start with a specific set of query points that fixed, and let's call that S over here. And you note the predictions of the given victim model, as well as all of the reference models that you have from the first distribution. And let's say you have 100 points over here you can look at the predictions of these 100 points and use some distribution similarity metric, something like the KL divergence metric, to compute this value. And you repeat the same thing for the other set of shadow models. And the idea here is that based on the KL value, you can infer which of the two training distributions the victim model actually came from. And in practice, we observe that this attack works really well. Not only does it outperform the current state-of-the-art black box attack, which is the one by Aulius group, it also outperforms the existing white box attacks and by a significant margin. So uh, to be specific in this graph over here, uh, we are considering the setting where one possible distribution is perfectly balanced in males and females. And then the other one can have an alpha ratio of females. And we try different alpha values across experiments to see how these attacks perform. And as you can observe over here, the yellow one, which is our contribution, outperforms the attacks in all scenarios consistently. And we observe this trend to be true across all the data sets we tested for. Now, I just talked about black box and white box access, and I think most of us have a pretty good idea of what that means. But the thing is, in research, black box access almost never truly means black box access because there's always these implicit assumptions that end up making it a gray box scenario. So we tried looking at property inference and distribution inference in particular and see what happens if you start relaxing these assumptions one by one. Because a lot of these works will talk about having black box access, but end up using the exact same model architecture, or maybe the even feature extractors are the same, or you assume access to model predictions directly. So as a specific example, I'll talk to be, uh, today about the label only access. 
And if you recall the KL divergence attack that I just described, I talked about the KL divergence metric and you know it takes a form that looks something like this, X log X, Y, Y. And it's perfectly fine if you have access to model predictions because the scores will vary in zero and one. So you don't really have to worry about any numerical errors. But as soon as you return model predictions instead of prediction probabilities, you run into this issue of having either zeros or ones, and you can't really use that in the log form over here. So we try to work around this uh, limitation in two possible ways. The first one is inspired by works in membership inference that try neighborhood sampling. So for a given input query point, you sample multiple points in some epsilon norm wall radius based on noise added to the input point and take the aggregate prediction to get some proxy for the confidence score. And that works really well. So if you compare it to the setting where you have access to actual prediction probabilities, this attack ends up retaining most of its inference accuracy. But at the same time, you're also querying multiple times to the victim's model because it's based on neighborhood sampling. So instead of the one query you would have used for the attack in the normal setting, you end up querying 10 times, which is a 10x increase. So we also tried looking at a more simple approach, which is just replacing the zero and one values with something like epsilon and one minus epsilon and just plugging it in the KL attack directly and see if that works. And surprisingly, it retains a big chunk of its inference risk. So the inference accuracies in the worst case drop only from 99 to let's say 96%. And this is interesting because as an, as an adversary, even if you don't have access to the confidence scores, you can do something as trivial as just replacing the zero and one values and still get very high inference risk. And we have a uh, in-depth discussion of multiple aspects of the adversary's knowledge in the paper. And to summarize those findings, we see that, as I just talked about logits and confidence scores, not having access to them is not an issue. And similarly, if you try relaxing the assumption on same feature extractors, you still end up getting very potent attacks. And the same holds true if you have a difference in the model architectures that the victim and adversary are using. And more interestingly, even if you have few shadow models, you end up getting very high inference risk. So for context, uh, these white box attacks currently end up using as many as three, 4,000 shadow models to get any sort of sensible inference risk. But with our attack, you can get high uh, leakage with as few as 10 shadow models. So that's a significant reduction in resource requirement. Now, having looked at all of these attacks and the situations where they can or cannot work, we wanted to look at potential defenses that could be helpful with distribution inference. And most of them are noise-based, which end up working really well if you think about uh, differential privacy or adversarial smoothing uh, for robustness. Specifically, we tried looking at differential privacy and just to clarify, theoretically, there is no reason for this to work because this is uh, focusing on the exact members and the membership, whereas distribution inference cares about statistical properties of the entire training distribution. But at a first glance, you may think that this, uh, this differential privacy is working really well because in the case where there's no DP, you get this attack success rate of about 80% and it drops to as low as 70 if you have some sort of DP training for the victim model. But if you take a closer look at this setting, you'll observe that most of the drops in inference risk actually come from the difference in training setups. So it's not DP itself that helping uh, the victim model, it's the fact that the victim is using differential privacy while the adversary is not. And as soon as you account for this by having both of them use differential privacy, we see that the inference risk jumps back up. And in fact, it actually ends up being higher than the case where none of them were using DP. So not only does DP not help you, it actually ends up hurting you if you care about property inference. So any arbitrary model differences between the victim and uh, adversary will end up giving you a false sense of protection, whereas most of it is originating from this difference over here. And we also have experiments with different kinds of noise-based defenses. We try differential privacy, label poisoning, adversarial robustness. And the common observation is that these just do not work at all. So we also th thought of looking at things that might work. So if you recall the original example where there was a bias in the training distribution, if you look at this particular example, and let's say the blue one here corresponds to females and the orange is males, this could be something like 75% females and 25% males. So as a victim, if you want to hide this uh, ratio to, in some sense, the most trivial thing to do would be to resample and make a different synthetic distribution. So you could adjust it by either undersampling or oversampling such that you end up having an equal number of males and females. 
And while this does help with distribution inference and you end up getting no risk, this opens different kinds of problems. Specifically, if you care about fairness, this kind of a defense ends up hurting both precision and recall if you care about sensitive attributes in a data sets. And at the same time, uh, side channel attacks are also more vulnerable. So because of the repetitions in oversampling or the relative differences in uh, contributions of data points, you end up being more vulnerable to membership inference as well. And while we, while we have tried to uh, look at different aspects of the distribution inference setup and make contributions in them, there's still a lot of open questions, as Valentin said. Uh, the first one being, is there a better white box attack? Because the fact that the black box attacks right now outperforms the white box attacks can have two possible uh, interpretations. The first one is that either there's untapped potential right now, or the trajectory, the trajectory over here is similar to membership inference, where usually black box attacks end up performing just as good as white box attacks. The second is thinking about model free attacks, because even though we reduce the number of uh, shadow models from a few thousands to as low as 10, you still need to train those 10 models. And that may not be an issue if you're working with something like a ResNet, but if you some, have something like chat GPT, you cannot even train one model. So thinking of attacks that don't really require shadow models is something we definitely need to focus on as a field. And the third is access to these distributions and sampling from them. So as I mentioned at the beginning, you, uh, the, we assume that the adversary has access to sampling the distributions and data from it. But what happens if the estimates of the distributions are noisy or if the adversary can only sample from one of the two distributions in the binary setting and seeing if the attacks that we have right now can still be modified to work in those settings. So any takeaways I would like the audience to have today is that distribution inference is surprisingly potent, even when these assumptions in the black box scenario are relaxed one by one. And the factors that impact this inference risk are not very well understood. Uh, I think Valentin's group made uh, very good contributions in that, trying to link it with causality. But the important thing over here is that the defenses that usually end up giving some sense of protection in security and privacy don't end up working really well here. And you can scan this QR code if you want to learn more about the work. And I'll be happy to chat with anyone about that. Thanks.